Hello and welcome to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging field of data science. We bring the best minds in data, software engineering, machine learning and artificial intelligence. Now here are your hosts, Frank Lavinia and Andy Leonard. Hello and welcome back to Data Driven, the podcast where we explore the emerging fields of data science, machine learning and artificial intelligence. If you like to think of data as the new oil, then you can consider us car talk because we focus on where the rubber meets the road. And with me on this epic road trip down the information superhighway is Andy Leonard. How are you doing, Andy? I'm doing well, Frank. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing okay considering I uh, somehow I managed to get a hairline fracture in my foot. Oh no. So, I'm trying to take the the positive route though. Um, you know, if you ever doubt that some small thing can have a major impact, <laughs> then you've never had a hairline fracture. So, Ouch. That sounds painful. It is surprisingly painful. Mm. Um and, and the doctor, I had to go to urgent care cuz it was that bad last night and um I was just, you could barely see it on the screen. So she wow. caught it. And when she printed out the the little x-ray things, and I was like, if you didn't know it was there, it would look like a mistake on the, with the, the printer head ink or something <laughs> like that. It was just, it's like that, that minor. Wow. The good news is, is that there's nothing really to, you know, nothing that I need to do other than rest it and put one of those weird looking shoes on. Those are cool shoes. I like them. Yeah, I, I feel like there's a market there for Crocs. I don't know. <laughs> well, it's we have a like we have a mutual friend who loves Crocs. Yes, he does. <laughs> he, he does. So, um, yeah. So um, I know your voice is a little scratchy. It is. Yeah, it's that time of year. You know, the trees are starting to bud here in Central Virginia. Um, we have these really uh, warm days. Like today, it's supposed to be near sixty, and yesterday. Uh, and, and all of us are in Virginia and Maryland. Uh, we were talking about how we got snow and ice. Um, so the mid Atlantic, right? If you don't like the weather, just wait, it'll change. That's right. And usually it'll change to something more awful. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. But I hope, I hope I'm okay. I've got some cough drops here in case things get crazy and I'll, I'll be on guard with the mute to, uh, so you won't have to hear me hacking and cough. Uh, the, the, the listeners won't have to hear it. I'll have to hear it and edit that. That's true. You may have to edit so, it out. So please do that, Andy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we're doing something a little different today. Uh, this is the first time in, I think we have like 178 episodes or something like that. Last week, we didn't do the formal intro about the information superhighway, blah, blah, blah. Um, this week, we're doing something new with uh, having two guests on at the same time. That's, that's crazy. exciting. <laughs> It's exciting. So, so uh, I will introduce them uh, both at a time. We have uh, Ronald Schmelzer and Kathleen Walsh. Uh, hopefully I pronounced that right. And they are um, at Cognolytica. Ron is a principal analyst, managing partner, and founder of the uh, firm. And Kathleen is a serial entrepreneur, a savvy marketer, and an AI and machine learning expert and tech industry connector. And she's uh, also a founder of Cognolytica. And um, welcome to the show, folks. Hey, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having us. Hey, no problem, no problem. So first off, um, what is Cognolytica? Because I discovered you guys um, through your podcast, basically. Yeah. Well, well, we're, we're amazing. That's pretty much all anybody really has to know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but the reason for the amazingness is uh, a few things. So Cognolytica, we are a research and advisory firm focused on artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cognitive technologies. So you can kind of see where the cognitive and analytics kind of combine to make the name Cognolytica kind of comes in there. And our primary audiences are enterprises. So we primarily serve uh, large corporations across a wide range of industries uh, where we're, our primary focus is helping them understand how to put these cognitive technologies into actual practice. So we spend a lot of time writing about best practices, methodologies, use cases, and of course, research on what's happening in the vendor landscape. Right. So we cover about 3,000 vendors in the landscape. 
And we have a very robust research calendar coming up. Like Ron said, we do a lot of research um, and and writing. In addition to that, we also host the AI Today podcast where we interview end users on how they're implementing AI. And we also have various use case podcasts on how certain and different industries are um, using artificial intelligence. Interesting. So, so is there a, is there like an elevator pitch that can kind of sum up the state of AI in enterprises? Yeah, I mean, the, the interesting thing about it is that the term artificial intelligence hangs up a lot of people. They get hung up on that term. They think the Terminator. They think all sorts of stuff. <laughs> but actually, um, where the rubber meets the road, a lot of the technologies that are enabled by this movement towards AI. We like to say it's not a technology. AI is actually really not a technology. It's a it's a it's an approach or it's a goal. It's it's a it's a study of trying to make machines more intelligent. A lot of those low level technologies are very widely implemented. We see things like natural language processing and computer vision and hyper personalization and predictive analytics and and so many things that that are sort of enabled by machine learning. Uh, which is an aspect of artificial intelligence, those things are happening very broadly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one use case that we bring up in just about every single industry is AI enabled chatbots. So like Ron said, you know, there's a lot of different technologies that um, this overarching artificial intelligence falls into, but a few of them, you know, many industries use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say I, it's interesting to see chatbots being kind of the that that tip of the spear, for lack of a better term. Uh, if you look at the most widely, at least consumer adopted versions of AI, I mean, it's really been um, Siri, it's been Alexa, it's been Google Home, uh, and and to a lesser extent Cortana. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, th those technologies have really, uh, I think, captivated the uh, the public. And they've proven themselves pretty useful. In fact, I you know I was very skeptical when I first saw a lot of this chatbot stuff. I'm like, nah, I don't know. But when I kind of started diving into it, I kind of had my like, oh, you know what? This is important type moment. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting because we also see that chatbots, not necessarily, um, and the, what we call the voice assistants, not necessarily as as like the prime example of of even the best use case of artificial intelligence, but because it's just so available, the, you know, the consumer audience can understand it. Mm -hmm. That you know, it's it's one of those things where people remember the Turing test. They're like, oh, I can speak to something, and now I don't know if it's a person or a machine. That that's all. Um, really important. But we actually ha ran a benchmark recently to see really how intelligent uh, these devices are. And, and it was very well publicized. So uh, one of those, one of, that's one of our pieces of research we call the Cognolytica Voice Assistant Benchmark. And actually these devices are much dumber <laughs> yeah. than, than, you, than you might think, right? Yeah. And, you know, th they're available in, you know, every single iPhone comes with Siri. So people have access to this and then you can buy um an alexa device for like 30 bucks you know they practically are giving them away so people i i think that people really can relate to them because they're so widely available and they also you know do things that people find mildly helpful and a lot of right. people call them smart speakers and we don't like that term i think we think that that downplays their actual capabilities we call them virtual right. assistants but yeah like ron said in our benchmark we uh, we asked them each 100 questions and every single one got a failing failing grade so nobody got above <laughs> yeah. oh, i think no. maybe 25 or 30 was the most yeah, that so. that uh one was able to answer which is not great yeah. But at the same time, um, I think the whole voice activated interface, I think if we think about it as an interface, if we look at it for um, for enabling people who have challenges typing, um, you know, that 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 technology fills a, an interesting void. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, too, because speaking is a lot easier than typing or swiping. It's it's natural. So little kids are able to do it. Elderly are able to do it. People with disabilities are able to do it. So, the, right. you know, the ability of these and the applications can be very 
useful. We're just not quite there yet. Yeah. I mean, the case in point, like um, if you ask an Alexa device, you know, what is red plus blue? Even if you make it really specific, like what is the color red plus the color blue? It doesn't understand what what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And actually, what's funny is that my my children are very little and they have this little device that, you know, it's supposed to read along. It's like a little electronic device. And one of them asked, what is red plus yellow? And I'm like, you've got to be kidding because they're expecting three-year-olds to know this, but Alexa doesn't know it. Right. Dumber than a three-year-old. And other things like, you know, what happens when you melt ice? And these are the kinds of questions we ask. You know, like, how much does a pound of peas weigh, right? You know, it's kind of... (laughs) (laughs) And and these devices don't get it. It, It's not not because these these questions are complicated. It's because they don't... There's like a this lack of understanding. And so one of the things we talk about is that we've been talking a lot about machine learning, which is great, which is primarily focused on patterns and pattern matching and pattern recognition and anomalies. But what these devices need to get that at next level of intelligence is what's called machine reasoning, which is, okay, now you know the pattern. Can you deduce? Can you induce? Can you figure out what is actually meant? And we haven't actually quite figured that out yet. That's actually, I think, the edge of our of our AI research is kind of in that. But that, isn't, um, that, isn't that a big... Um... Doesn't that lead to the road of artificial general intelligence? I mean, if you solve kind of machine reasoning, you take away a big obstacle between where we are now and um, artificial general intelligence. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 definitely one of those steps to get us there. That's why I'm not particularly afraid of where we are in the universe. It's like people are afraid of the the super intelligence. I'm like, yeah, well, have you have you talked to Siri lately? But, yeah. <laughs> but right, right, you're right. right. It's it's actually something that that um, uh, predates a lot of a lot of our conversations about AI. the idea of the so-called D.I.K. UW pyramid, which which I think maybe a lot of your listeners might be familiar with. And what we're doing is we're slowly stepping our way up this pyramid, right? D is data, I is information, K is knowledge, U is understanding, and W is wisdom, which, you know, you can argue that maybe not a lot of people have. But, uh, <laughs> but, but you know, mm-hmm. what we're doing is we're sort of, what, what uh, machine learning has enabled is the extraction of knowledge from information which is basically looking at the patterns and saying, okay, I, now I know this rather than, yes, I have this information. And that's kind of where we are. And of course, the machine reasoning is trying to branch between, bridge between knowledge and understanding, which is that next step up. Right. And we're not at understanding yet. So, you know, we're not sure how long it's going to take to get there, but these are hard problems to solve. Yeah. So, so what, what is the current um, state of the art in machine reasoning? Like, where are we? Is it, uh, and, and who are the, who's working on this problem? Is it the usual suspects? Um, well, of course. I mean, obviously, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Netflix, Amazon, IBM, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Baidu, yeah, yeah. Alibaba. Yeah, of course. Maybe you know, Huawei. <laughs> Huawei, Uber. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I mean, because they just have so much data. I mean, it's just like, you know, that's the thing about artificial intelligence is that it rewards having the more data you have, the more insights you can develop, the more patterns you can build, the more models you can build. There are research um institutions and universities that are working on this as well. Right. But but I would say there's a lot of interesting happening in the startup land. So if you're looking for 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 sort of like who's doing research specifically on this, you know, the 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 sort of the the words that are being used in this realm are things like knowledge graphs, ontologies, uh, things called like common sense is another yeah. word for it. Although common sense kind of has fallen out of um, uh, favor because uh, because uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of an oxymoron what they say about common sense it's neither common necessarily nor sense huh. but um, <laughs> but but there's a lot of <laughs> but like this whole idea the knowledge graph is interesting because this is an area where where um, you know companies like Facebook are like looking at the conversations and trying to say wait a sec can we step up a level here and say not look at specifically what you're saying but what the intents are and then deduce from that like okay you know this person is a mother, a mother is part of a family, a family unit's connected together. What does this mean? And, you know, it's both exciting and scary. (laughs) What's happening there? Yeah, we also um, interviewed uh, someone from Stanford recently, and he was talking about a lot of research that's coming out of that university on this as well. Nice. Well, your comment about, uh, about common sense reminded me of something one of our guests said, um, they were commenting on artificial intelligence, and and they said maybe our problem is we don't have enough natural intelligence. 
Yeah, I mean, people always like to poke fun, but actually common sense is, we we say some people don't have common sense and Ron makes that joke a lot, but you know, it is really hard to teach and you, you learn from experience. So sure. you learn not to put your hand on a hot stove because maybe you've done it or you've watched mm -hmm. somebody do it and get burned, or you know not to dump a pitcher of water on yourself because you'll get wet. And, right. you know, various things that are common sense. And that's very hard to teach. It's you learn by example. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is actually it's one of those classical problems. For example, it's really easy with machine learning to say, let's say you use a video and you have a picture of someone holding a cup of water and they tip it over and you and you train your machine learning model on like lots and lots of images and videos of people taking a cup of water and tipping it over and saying, OK, you know, this is water spilling. Right. So then you present another picture of a cup and tip it over, like, what's going to happen? They're like, well, water will spill. That's like, okay, well, now let's take a big bucket, right? Or something that doesn't even look like a bucket. Let's take, a, you know, some some other vessel of some sort and, and say, like well, a vase or right, something. tip it over. What will happen? Machine learning model will be like, I don't recognize this. Mm -hmm. And of course, humans do. And th that's the thing we don't, we haven't quite figured out, which is the, the bigger picture of what's called generalization, which is that machine learning models are all about trying to generalize, uh, which is you know, trying to take some specific use cases and then apply that in a model such that future ones can basically um, uh, understand what that means. Yeah. Another right. really good example that we like to bring up is the, um, I think it was a New York Times article about the elephant in the room, where it was an actual elephant in the in the room and the um, the models were not able to understand it. So it would be a person sitting on a couch and an elephant behind them or an elephant <laughs> sitting at a table eating cereal. And the, the machine learning models were not trained to recognize an elephant. So it just didn't recognize right. an elephant where any child would look at this photo and be like, wow, look, there's an elephant because they, you know, they right. can understand that um, even within the context of a photo where an elephant shouldn't be there. Computers are can be very literal, I think, by nature, can't they? Absolutely. Yeah. Even some people yeah. that we work with are like that. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Like, I know I told you that, but I didn't really mean that, right? Yeah. What, what was the character in Guardians of the Galaxy? Drax? Was his Drax, name? yes. Where he says um, one car uh, the, the, the raccoon, um, I forget his name, but um, Rocket. said something like Rocket, right? Yeah. He said, uh, oh, he doesn't get metaphors that go straight over his head. And he goes, no, my, I would catch it because my reflexes are that fast. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Nothing gets over my head. <laughs> right, right. Nothing gets over my head. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let's not bring in any Spaceballs references. <laughs> oh, no, let's do Mel Brooks yeah, yeah, movies. Yeah. We do movie quotes. <laughs> so we've got one so far for the day. So that works. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We had a drought for a while, but I uh, know. it's kind of a... Uh, a theme. Die Hard actually comes up quite a bit. Quite a bit, yes. Um, um, one question that I have about you, kind of moving a little in a little different direction, because I think you may be the first guest we've had that also have a podcast. I'd love to know more about that. How to get started? Sure. So it got started about a year and a half ago. Ron and I, um, you know, we really saw that there was an, a a need within our um, subscribing audience as well as uh, you know, in general, that um, there weren't a lot of use case podcasts on how end users are really implementing AI in their uh, work environment. And that's a question that we get asked a lot. You know, a lot of people want to become more AI enabled and, you know, use these technologies, but they're not really sure where to begin. So we created the podcast to help fill that that void within the market. Yeah, so, so really we try nice. to do two things in our podcast. I mean, one, we try to talk through use specific use cases. So sometimes there'll be industry use cases like, isn't this industry in interesting? AI is being used in the mining industry. Yeah. That's really interesting. Right. How is that? Or, or there'll be sort of what's called use patterns. Like we'll talk about hyper-personalization. We actually just recently published one on that. And we'll say, okay, well, this is what it's all about. This is the, this is the benefits. But then again, here are some of the significant uh, issues that we need to deal with on right. that. And then, of course, we'll also interview folks. But our interviews are always like the, the people who are, tr who are trying to put AI into practice. You know, we really try to focus on not really looking necessarily on research uh, too much. I know we've had a few of those. Um, but really much more on like, hey, we, we talked to this, the, we talked to the CTO at Boeing, who's telling us about how, uh, um, you know, the future of autonomous aircraft and mm -hmm. just the other ways that AI is being used um, in uh, production. So, 
that, I think that I think that gives our listeners this comfort to to know that there are other people out there doing it. That it's not science fiction. That these aren't sort of you know lab projects that people are just talking about. No one's really doing mm -hmm. that. That's sort of the point, right. just to highlight. Like, yeah, people really are doing this. this yeah, this and stuff. I I think it helps to hear firsthand how people are using it. So we've had a, a lot of banks on our podcast. We've also had, um, like Ron said, Boeing. We've had Fox on. We had the CTO from Fox as well. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll put a link in our uh, show notes for sure. But I found your podcast by searching for AI Today podcast. Right, the AI Today podcast. We should have mentioned the name. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a great, great podcast. Um, I will confess that I've only listened to a part of one, and I blame my uh, pesky customers uh, for that problem. Being a consultant and um, entrepreneur, it, uh, it's awesome on most days. Uh, it's not awesome if you want to carve out an hour to listen to some cool podcasts. Yeah. Uh, I hear you. So. Yeah, we, we, try, we try to keep our podcasts in sort of the 20 to 30 minute zone. Yeah. If we can. A lot of our listeners tell us that they listen to it um, on their commute. Or in the shower. I don't really know. We don't, we don't really ask <laughs> too much. Or like, you know. Yeah. My commute's like 30 seconds up the stairs yeah. most of the time. But, After a long meal. you know, <laughs> the, the downside of working from home, right? So you live at work. Exactly. I know. Yeah, we have that same problem. Yeah. So the, um, sorry, I cut you off. Jump in. Um, so no, I think that's I think it's great. The, your podcast is great at that because one of the the problems that 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 I hear a lot is uh, everyone talks about AI, but no one's implementing it. At least that's that's the myth. I mean, clearly people are implementing it, and it's good to kind of direct them to your show. I'm like, well, you know, if the CTO of Boeing is talking about this. Then mm -hmm. you know, this is not fantasy. This is real. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the thing about I, I think that is sort of one of the the interesting i say quirks or maybe paradoxes or something about ai is like actually artificial intelligence is really old uh, artificial intelligence both as a as a name you know it was coined at that 1956 dartmouth conference that's like 60 uh it's two, like as old 60, as ron no. <laughs> <laughs> holy, holy. i got, got 20 years on me <laughs> You just, it does not have 20 years on me. So <laughs> just, I'll just leave it there. But anyway. Um, no, but you're right. Yeah, it's, old, it's a yeah. relatively old term. Right. And a lot of the terms we've been batting, you know, batting around today are considered, I guess, subsets of the science where, you know, that, that falls under the large umbrella of uh, AI. Yeah. I'm, so does that make AI retro? Uh, <laughs> a retronym. Ooh. Mm. Well, well, I, th I think I th where's that sound effect, Frank? <laughs> oh. Well, you have sound effects. Oh, oh there you go. Ooh, nice. Oh, yeah. But dum bum. Yeah. So I, th I think that's why we were saying, like, you know, a lot of people, the, the idea of, of artificial intelligence that's been around in the popular culture um, for a long time. And a lot of times it's in the popular culture, it's referring to like that ultimate vision, you know, not just the Terminators and the hell, you know, uh, vision, but also, um, you know, C-3PO and RTD2 and all these other things and the Borg and, you know, Johnny S Five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Johnny Five. Johnny um, Five. And I think, and Chappie. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like we sometimes we will use the term with our customers cognitive technologies it's like it, it kind of implies almost the same thing but not really it makes it feel much more sedate like are you doing ai right. i'm doing cognitive technologies people are like oh okay does that <laughs> sounds more expensive does that mean, yeah exactly does that mean i get a budget <laughs> <laughs> enterprise cognitive technologies there you go Ooh. we have to see if that domain name's taken it's probably pretty long <laughs> probably not it's yours <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, I like Cognolitica. That's a nice name. I think he did a good job picking out uh, a good name. Thanks. The magic of the catchy description. Yeah. Available domain. <laughs> available but social no, media handle. Trust us, uh, we know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we went through that. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason why it's dot TV. That's oh. right. <laughs> So uh, we have a list of questions that we usually ask our guests mm -hmm. and uh, we send these uh, just so people know, we actually send these out ahead of time. So, and especially in this case, it's our first time we've had two guests mm -hmm. on. 
So I think uh, y'all have decided which one, uh, you know, which one each of you will answer. Uh, but I very we'll give you unique. We'll give sorry? you double. We'll give you answers on both from each of us. Oh, awesome! Okay, so the, awesome. The first one is uh, how did you find your way into data? And kind of a, another question we work in with that is, did you find data, or did data find mm. you? So I'll get us. I'll get us started here, and Kathleen's got a great story as well. So. Um, you know, I've been I've been on the entrepreneurial technology bent for a long time. Um, uh, even before I went to, to college, I started my first uh, business installing networks, Novell Networks in 1991, which was quite the thing. Like other people were mowing lawns during the summer. I was installing Novell Networks. Yeah. That's back when we used to carve our own chips oh, out of wood. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was the real hardware. Exactly. Yeah. So... Uh, did you have to carry the network cables up and down the hill in the snow both yeah, ways? Exactly, and I had to. Yeah, exactly. I had to sleep <laughs> under the desks installing them. So, um, so then I, I, I really got uh, this. Actually, is one of your later questions about a book, and I'll recommend a book. But this book really got me hooked on MIT. And actually, ironically, it was a lot of this. This book was about artificial intelligence. It was like the early creators of of this Marvin Minsky and on all those people. And I'm like, I really wanted to go to MIT, so I went to MIT, and I met a, a, a bunch of my. Uh, colleagues there who ended up, uh, we started our first startup in 1994. Uh, it's called Virtue Mall. It was one of the first online shopping malls. And actually, it's in Wikipedia. It's interesting. There's a whole entry. I remember oh, Virtue do? Mall. I, I do. I do. I, I, I too had startup dreams in, in, in the mid-90s and um, used that as an example of the changing nature well, there you of go. We were like one of the first, we were like, we had like invent shopping cart technology. Brad Feld was one of our first investors. He later became very well known as uh, starting the Foundry Group and uh, tech stars and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, you know, it's funny because I was actually going to school at the same time when that company was uh, happening. And uh, my my thesis, well, not my thesis, if I actually wasn't that PhD student, but my, my undergraduate advisor was Rodney Brooks, of all people. Who was at MIT? So I, I really got like into all this really quickly. But of course, you know, startup land, startup world sort of took over AI world. It was the crazy dot com days. We raised a ridiculous amount of money, and then the company got acquired um, by Click Commerce in in the mid two thousands. When of course everything started to uh, fall apart. And and just as that was happening, I I basically uh, we became very involved in, in XML, which was this um, standard for uh, exchange of, of data. Um, they're just still around. And um, I got involved with all these standards bodies. And as part of that, I, uh, I started a, an analyst firm called ZapThink, which was focused on the emergence of XML, web services, and then what ended up becoming service-oriented architecture, a whole approach towards building these composable services. That analyst firm ran for a good 10 years, uh, grew very quickly. We built a, wow. a great reputation behind, uh, behind it. Um, that company was also acquired in, in 2011 by a government contractor called Dovell Technologies. And then uh, while I was kind of like looking for something new to do, I actually was going to get back into the retail uh, software business. Uh, I, I started a, a meetup uh, called Tech Breakfast, which, was, uh, which is this morning demo focused event. And and basically that actually grew a lot faster than the startup. So so I ended up sort of putting the startup aside wow. and focusing on tech breakfast. And this is where, where Kathleen and I actually got connected so she could pick up on some of that story. At that point, um, tech breakfast grew. And then over the course of doing tech breakfast, we, we basically saw AI resurging in interest. And that's when we're like, okay, now it's time to, to sort of put back our, our analyst shoes on and um, start digging into what's actually happening. That was like late 2016, early 2017 when we did that. And, and so basically, you know, to answer your question in a long-winded way, it's like, you know, I've been involved in this uh, for, for a really long time. And I, and I feel like sort of the industry is like this weird loop. It's like this mm -hmm. weird cycle. It's like somehow I managed to get all the way back through all this adventure back to where I was when I, had, when I started <laughs> MIT. And so here we are. Yeah. <laughs> so I started my career in marketing. Uh, I worked for Hard Hanks, which was a large um, marketing company, and I worked heavily on the Bed Bath & Beyond accounts. So a lot of the mailers that came, I worked on, and that was very data-driven. So I was working with data all day, every day. And um, I did that for about five years. And then after that, my husband and I had started um, a startup called Hourly B. And uh, I ran that for about a year. That's how I first connected with Ron. Um, my husband and I shut that down. It was um, 
similar in to what handy has become now where it was connecting people and um, cleaners and service providers in that respect. Um, and so then uh, I joined Ron at Tech Breakfast, um, maybe a year or two into it. And we really grew that. Um, it became um, a very large meetup. We were one of the largest. We had over 50,000 members and we ran it in 11 cities every month throughout the country. We also had a very big morning demo stage at South by Southwest for four years. And we ran the um, hardware and meetup and AI uh, meetup at South by Southwest as well. Um, and then we did various other events. We did a Startup Spectacular event and we ran um, venture capitalist events as well. Nice. Yeah, Tech Breakfast was was really hot. Like, I mean, it was just all over the place. You would just see, oh, like good. on Twitter, I would see it. And I uh, I think I even attended, I know I attended at least one or two. And I think um, for a time when I was doing startup oh. evangelism at Microsoft, I think I actually oh, filmed yeah, some of it. Yeah, we, we, we ran the event at the Microsoft yeah. uh, Silver Spring location and yeah, Chevy Chase, mm -hmm. right? Chevy Chase. Yeah, um, I, I remember where it was <laughs> on Wisconsin Avenue. And then we also <laughs> we also did it at the formerly known as AOL campus in Northern Virginia, which is now Oath, but now they've changed it again to the Verizon Bible. Media. I, I'm confused by this whole by their whole landscape. <laughs> their business model clearly has evolved from sending millions and millions of DVDs and CDs to people <laughs> to to what I'm yes. not entirely sure, but. <laughs> <laughs> so um that's trippy that you were a part yeah, of virtual mall that's those awesome are fun days uh, i need to expand that wikipedia entry i i early in my career i was uh, at barnesandnoble.com before it became oh. barnesandnoble.com oh, that is so neat. yeah so mm -hmm. small world huh uh so so here's the next question what's your favorite part of your current gig so i love we like i said we talked we talk to and cover 3000 vendors in this space. And so I love talking to them and, you know, getting their perspective on the AI market and seeing, uh, you know, how they're evolving. And then I also uh, really do enjoy hosting our AI Today podcast. I get to talk to so many different people in the space and hear great use cases and, you know, talk, talk to some, some luminaries in, in the field. Uh, and I, I really enjoy doing the research. We're actually working right now on a whole research system where we've got a very aggressive research schedule to cover. Uh, we just did a massive classification of the AI market. We were dissatisfied with the way that people were, were sort of uh, trying to to categorize uh, the market for, for AI. It was like everybody was putting a bunch of logos on a on a on a graphic and then saying, okay, well these are all in data science. I'm like that's not useful, <laughs> because if you're if you're trying to actually implement stuff and, and and make this technology work, you're evaluating apples and oranges vendors. So we we spent like a solid month plus just classifying the market. We published that research. It's available for free on our site. We had a podcast about it, all sorts of stuff, into into at least eighty sub markets. We're producing about forty reports on that. And I really love that research process because it's sort of distilling that information to, okay, what does this really mean? What is this really for? Because you can't really count on these vendors to, to give you a straight answer because they're, they're, you know, they're trying to, one, they're, of course, they're trying to sell stuff. But two, it's not entirely clear that they really understand it either. <laughs> Sometimes we're on these, you know, we're on these calls and I'm like, we're like, okay, well, um, you know, especially there's, there's this big, uh, uh, Pro, I don't call it a problem, but there's there's this situation in the industry called pseudo AI. If you haven't talked about it, you, you you might want to look into it. Where you have companies that are selling or producing AI solutions, but they really have humans um, doing the thing that the machines are supposed to be doing. Probably because the technology is not there or whatever it is. Like you know, there was a couple of really well noted examples: Expensify, which is supposed to be scanning in the invoices and and automatically using. A computer vision to do it was actually using people mm -hmm. to, to do it. They had hired them out. I don't know if it was on Mechanical Turk or where um, to do that. Uh, um, and that, that also happened with one of the uh, scheduling companies, X.AI. I don't know if they're still doing it. as well. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so it's, this is a problem because it's sort of a false promise for AI. And so when we go into these vendors, we say, okay, well, I know we're going to tell me about your solution, but tell me, are there any humans in the loop? Are there any humans like necessary to make your product work? And we're always surprised. Like, well, yeah, we do have. I'm like, okay, is this AI or is this HI human intelligence, <laughs> right? 
And uh, and so I lo I love that. I mean, I, I love sort of right. digging deep and getting into it and clarifying it because because we want this all to 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 succeed. I've also heard that called artificial artificial intelligence. <laughs> That's another way to put it, right? Right. Um. So yeah, we really enjoy doing that. The other thing that we other really also really like doing is is really helping um, actual companies try to to put this stuff into practice. There's a lot of great. Um, good use cases that, that are really helpful. It's like, you know, in the insurance industry, like automated automating the whole claims processing system by using computer vision and natural language processing. Um, in the government, we actually, you know, a good half of our clients are government and government agencies and government contractors. And there's a lot of inefficiency, no surprise. Yeah. <laughs> in the government, you might, in, in some cases, <laughs> you might want the government to be more, you know, AI. And in some cases, you might not want the government to be more in with AI. Yeah. It's like, you know, do you really want the right. IRS using a machine learning model to figure out if you need to be audited? Sorry, guys, that's going to be happening. But, um, but on the other hand, it's like, you know, would you like to be able to like, you know, sign up for some sort of permit or like, you know, make something happen and do it at like two o'clock and get an approval at three o'clock in the morning, you know, not wait for a human to, to like, why do I need a person there to like to stamp something or to, you know, that right. those are great use cases yeah. for, for AI. And also to help guide you through the process. A lot of times people, you know, you're not renewing your driver's license very often or, you know, returning tags very often. So it would be nice if these AI enabled systems could help walk you through the process and then let you know that it was done correctly and you get your receipt right away, like Ron said, or be able to, I don't know, not work on their, their limited hours of operation. Right. Yep. Oh yeah. I mean, uh, I had a call to DMV yeah. recently and <laughs> yeah, <sighs> yeah. <laughs> I'll just leave it there. <laughs> but, um, the, uh, but but I mean you're right. I mean like and, and I think it's I think we're we're starting to see that not in government as well. But I mean also in and I had to fill out an expense report and I couldn't find the receipt for a hotel stay. So I went to that hotel chain's website and was looking for a chat bot to maybe figure out how to get the a PDF of my receipt. They didn't have it, so I actually had to call mm. and speak to a human being. Yeah, you had to talk to a human. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's very yeah. retro. I know. Human customer <laughs> service. Exactly. And kind of. Oh, wow. Well, also at some point that, that, that human contact is going to become more and more expensive compared to uh, rolling out an AI system. Right. And so a lot of people are trying to use the humans for the more, um, you know, specialized cases where they really need a human involved. And that I think helps, you know, humans feel more satisfied in their job as well, where they're not answering these mundane, silly questions and doing very repetitive tasks that, you know, oh, really yeah. are not best suited for humans. Yeah, and there's, um, yeah, I have a friend who's, who does performance tuning consulting for um, for database technology. And one of the things that he's done is he's, uh, he's he built an engine basically that will collect metrics on his customers' uh, instances. And, you know, when something bad happens, when they see something that raises a flag, it goes and gathers even more information, batches it up and sends it to his, you know, to his consultants. And what he's done over the few years he's had this going is that it's become a feedback cycle. And it's almost... It's a little of what you were talking about earlier, Ron, where it's the mechanical Turk, right? It started out very mechanical, but as they realized, oh, we saw this problem, this was the solution, here's the additional information we needed, and they just kept updating the, you know, the metadata that the engine collected, um, and it's, it's keeping, it's tuning itself, and it's, you know, it's almost like a slider of mechanical Turk to automation, and they're just moving it up with every yeah. customer interaction. You know, it's really interesting. Yeah, it is really cool. Oh, very yeah, cool. There's, there's, a, there's a, ahead, this interesting conversation I've been seeing, um, I think, on LinkedIn, where, where people are talking about the, how the sort of like the, the next generation, the millennials, are, are really reluctant to actually um, call on the phone for, for anything. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they expect like, you know, <laughs> self-service or an app or a texting or something like that. And uh, it's really funny because somebody was trying to actually hire someone for a sales job. Um, that involved a lot of sales and right. um, it's funny because they're, they're saying like, oh, you know, I'm having a hard time convincing this person that they should probably pick up the phone and call this lead 
uh, or this contact because it may do a better job than the email, the texting, blah, blah, blah. And there's just a, a certain amount of reluctance. So I think we're just, you know, that's sort of the, we're kind of in that cultural zeitgeist at, at, at the moment, you know? Yeah. So we have a couple of complete the sentence okay. questions. Uh, when I'm not working, I enjoy blank. So when I'm not working, I enjoy spending time with my family and working out. So the winter has been terrible. So I competed in a five week challenge to get me out there. And I have run and done more things in the snow than I would ever have done otherwise. <laughs> Yeah. That's, good. That's awesome. I've fallen more times in the snow than I would have otherwise. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I guess for me, so when I'm not working out, I really enjoy uh, spending time with my kids as well. I, one's uh, nine years old, the other one's uh, five, almost six. They're just hilarious. Um, and, and we do do a lot of stuff and, and, uh, I really enjoy, of course, you know, doing a lot of home technology stuff, you know, security system and you know, camera stuff and all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's kind of funny. My, my kid started getting really into chess and I never really was like into chess. Like I, you know, I, somehow I just kind of missed the whole chess bug, but of course he's getting into chess and that kind of got me into chess and now we're both into chess and it's kind of funny. So, um, so he's, he's doing this little chess thing as a chess competitions, tournaments and, Kind of, I'm sitting there. I'm like, ooh, you know, <laughs> I want to do that too. Um, so, so I'm really, really getting into that. Nice. Very cool. Well, we have uh, another fill in the blank. I think the coolest thing in technology today is. So I'll get that started. So I think the coolest thing in technology today is really how easy it is to to get access, not just to to technology. I mean, the whole idea of pervasive computing. We're basically walking around with a fully functional computer like in our pocket mm -hmm. or, or on our wrist all day and it gives us to access information anywhere right. everywhere uh, we talk about that like now it's the assumption that is that you will have access to the internet all the time like that's just become now the assumption when when school is out and canceled they're sending you a text message they're counting on you getting that text message it's crazy because 20 years ago that could not have been the assumption so it's just crazy that that that's kind of where we are right now with technology and the rate of progress um, and all that sort of stuff. I also think as a person who is a technologist, um, I really love the the ability to create. It's so easy now to build stuff. If you look, if you want to build an app, you want to build a web, you want to build anything, you can go and you can hammer this thing out in like almost no time now. I mean, we're actually building a system now using, oh, yeah. using, a, using something called Bubble. And it's like, you can build fully functional apps in like almost no time at all with very little coding. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. very wow, easy. Really? And and the other thing is like you know even in, even in the in the AI world, naturally there are like you can you can like with twenty lines of code, you got like a fully functional deep learning neural network. Of course, you need the data, you know that helps. But but the rest of it is is very um, accessible. So I, so I think that's the coolest thing about technology is like the ease of access, the ease of creation. Um, and all that sort of stuff. There's some other downsides, but I'll kind of go. Yeah. yeah. To follow up with that, actually, I remember when I was in college, it was before the time of smartphones, and we were in one of my senior classes talking about, you know, will we eventually get to the point where we will have little computers in our pockets? And we're like, well, you know, what would be the price point? Would people want to spend 700 or so dollars on this? And it's funny because fast forward a few years, and we all do that now we all are okay spending a thousand dollars on a phone that we're gonna have for like two years uh you know before it gets uh out of date or broken or whatever and and so it's just funny that you know how we have progressed so fast as a society that you know 15 years ago we were not okay spending 700 dollars on a phone and now we do it and you know don't even think twice Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, if you look at what Samsung announced, I, uh, their their top line phone yeah. is twice that. <laughs> no, it's so crazy. I'm like, so, oh my god. Yeah, laptops know? are cheaper than phones now. Pretty, pretty much. much. Yeah, I know. I remember. <laughs> I remember when laptops were really expensive, wow. and not everybody had one. Now it's almost the norm as well. Uh, so you know, I think uh, following up with that, I think I also think access is so awesome now, but not only access in the fact that all of us have smartphones and technology at the tip of our fingers, but that the, what it, what it allows us to do. So I can go on the internet and research basically anything that I want and know that knowledge right away where, you know, 15 years ago, I needed to go to like 
a actual library and an encyclopedia. Now I don't need to do that anymore. So it just, it gives me instant access to basically everything that I want. No, exactly. And there's, there's been questions that my kids have asked where I'll just say, you know, I would ask mm -hmm. uh, Alexa and, you know, and, and she'll give yeah. me an answer. Right. So actually, you'll probably hear her talk any second because I didn't realize I, I did not put her on mute. So yeah. she, uh, yeah, we have <laughs> she saw her light up. I was like, oh, no, 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 not you. <laughs> That's funny. So one of our other complete this sentence is, I look forward to the day when I can use technology to. Yeah, so I'll start that one. So I look forward to the day when I can use technology to not spend time doing the stupid stuff. <laughs> That's what technology is for. There's a lot of stupid stuff. Um, you know, just uh, obviously the inconveniences and and uh, uh, of like of of life that 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 really get in the way of enjoyment of life. Um, you know, that that's what I really really that that's what technology is supposed to be for. Um, I I think sort of like I didn't talk about this previously, but like sort of the flip side to technology access is technology access. Yeah. <laughs> Which what I mean by that is that you know uh, I think people are learning right now the downfalls of social media, right? That it's like it used to be the like with things like Facebook, like oh I can instantly you know find out what people are doing, and now it's like. It, it, it's become a trap for a lot of people that they're constantly connected. They're constantly sharing and it's like, con and, it, and it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't really know uh, that's helpful. I, th I think there's going to be, have to be some sort of reset with, with, uh, with all of that. Um, it's interesting because as I mentioned, you know, our kids are in, my kids are in elementary school. Your, your kids are going to be getting there soon. And it's like, they actually now have like, um, you know how you have like, you know, those health classes. It used to be about, you know, STDs and, <laughs> you know, whatever, covering your face and your cough, there is the new curriculum has to do with staying safe. First of all, staying safe on the internet. That's like a big thing now in the curriculum, but also now it's the perils of social media. Wow. And they spend, they actually spend time in class and be like, you know, don't wow. overshare, don't share your personal information with people you know, don't post this, don't post that, you know, uh, images last, wow. images last forever, yeah. you know, things like that. You know, data never goes away. And also you're sharing your information with all these systems that know where you are, where you live, blah, blah, blah. So this is kind of, so, so this is becoming now part of the, uh, I guess mm -hmm. it's part of the public health curriculum, which is interesting. They actually had um, a study recently about the loneliest people. And a lot of people, I mean, you would just assume, oh, the loneliest people are the elderly because, you know, they're getting up in age. Maybe some of their friends have died, whatever. And actually they say, no, the loneliest people are people like right out of college and the younger generations because they don't get as much interaction with people face to face and social media. It's, um, you know, making them feel bad about themselves and they're comparing themselves to others when people only really post good things on social media. Nobody ever really posts the downsides. And they said, you know, you can take 400 images and there's one image where you look good and that's the image that you post to social media. But the 399 images where you didn't right. look that flattering or, you know, it wasn't a great background, you weren't in such a cool spot, you won't post that. You'll only post the one. So it gives a false sense of people's lives that's as well. That's true. You only get to see other people's highlight reels. True. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so one thing that I look forward to is when self-driving cars will be able to drive me around. I do not love driving, and I feel like I have to do it way more than I want to. And I could use that time to do other things, not pay attention right. to the road, for example, <laughs> when I'm getting from point A to point B. I try that when I'm driving. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! It doesn't work nearly as well. There was a story that someone told me about her coworker watches movies, legitimately watches movies when he's driving. Oh my God! So of course, one day he totals his car. Oh, because he was watching a movie and not paying attention to the road. So wouldn't it be nice when we actually could watch movies and not worry about crashing oh. our cars? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah I'm right. you, you couldn't see me like <laughs> nodding and high fiving the air when you said self driving cars. I'm I'm right there with you. <laughs> It is very hard. I just want to say from firsthand experience to eat a taco <laughs> and drive. <laughs> Tacos and driving. That sauce gets on your pants too. I'm telling you, man, logistical <laughs> challenge. Enabled by self-driving vehicles. <laughs> so uh, next question is share something different about yourself, but do remember that it is a family podcast. Uh, sure. So something different about myself, I guess I'll, I'll share as my family, is we are all lefties. Mm. 
Yeah, I know. So huh? me, my husband, and you my mean, two girls. Uh, you mean like physically, not politically? Or I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> South Paws. We're all South Paws. So I told my husband that I wanted to like convert our house to a lefty friendly house. <laughs> <laughs> Does that involve moving all the doorknobs? Uh, well, it could. You know, also measuring cups. I don't know if you've ever used them, but they are not meant for lefties. Scissors, oh, yeah. knives, yeah, yeah like cake cutters yeah. when they don't have the double. Pretty much everything is wow. not meant for lefties. So I have started wow. started to make my house a little left-handed friendly, but um, then my, <laughs> I bought left-handed scissors. <laughs> my husband told me he can't use them now because he's so ingrained <laughs> cutting with his right hand. He doesn't know how to cut with his oh, left. Wow. Then both, both kids are left-handed. Both kids are left-handed. So, you know, it's definitely genetic then, right? I think so. I've been told it's not, but I'm like, well, you know, with those little charts you learn in mm -hmm. high school biology, if I'm left-handed and my husband's left-handed, my kid should be left-handed. But well, if it's a genetic trait, yeah. Yeah, but then I was told it's not. It's, it doesn't work like that, and so the percentage of them both being left-handed was, I guess, low. So I lucked out. My older son is left-handed, as was my dad. And when I was little, I was actually mm -hmm. ambidextrous. And they discouraged that, I guess, because that's what they did back yeah. then. And um, so to this day, I, I, I can do I do most of like the, the writing and, and stuff with my right hand. But like I'll do um, a lot of other things with with my left hand like that. I remember I was dating this girl and she was just so confused because she's like, I can't tell if you're left handed <laughs> or right. handed. <laughs> and I, I never really, really thought about it. I was like, oh, I it's interesting. So I guess I'm kind of a uh, um on on that fence there, but yeah, it's, it's it's interesting how that works. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I'm I'm, I'm most I'm primarily right-handed, but for some reason when I shoot pool, it's with my left hand. Really? I don't know. I just learned mm -hmm. how to shoot pool. I'm pretty much a hundred percent left. <laughs> it doesn't make me any better at it though. Just. <laughs> Oh sure, Ron. Sure, I know how this goes. <laughs> Just bring some money, and yeah, you'll see how know, bad I am playing pool. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. So, uh, for me, um, so I, actually, something I think I think Kathleen just realized she didn't know about that. Like something different about myself. So during my uh, uh, my college years, I was actually I played piano for I played keyboard for the for an improv comedy troupe. I played imp keyboard for Improv Boston. Did you Boston. play a synthesizer? <laughs> I did. I played the keyboard. Oh, Synthesize, yeah. Well, you'd play things like, you know, like oh, the, the you know, like whenever someone would like suggest something or they had to break out in song, you know, remember just like, what's my line? You, you know, I did that kind of, I mean, not, nothing yeah. like, you know, classical or anything like that. Um, so I, I, I did a lot of that and, and uh, I'm actually trying to get my kids at the piano now, so it's pretty cool. Um, the other thing I did uh, is actually how I met my wife is that I was uh, in swing dance for a long time, uh, did it uh, semi-competitively. Um, one every once in a while <laughs> but i did a lot of that and um oh, that, was, that was a lot of fun so swing dance and that and then of course now yeah i'm trying to get really trying to get better at chess it's like you know i'm trying to figure that mm. whole thing out now so that that that's kind of what i'm that's kind of what i'm doing right now i try oh. to get my son into chess but uh my older son into chess but mm. he wasn't into it so it, maybe later he's still a little on the young side but um uh, those are great Great, uh, great items that you shared. I find a lot of people are musical in technology. Mm -hmm. uh, just a lot of people. So um, where can people learn more about you two? So if they go to Cognolytica.com, they can learn more about us. We at Cognolytica, we also have our um, a link to our podcast there as well. And then we also have training as well. So Cognolytica.com slash training. We have a few open enrollment classes coming up throughout the year. And then we also deliver on-site training to government agencies and corporations as well. In addition to that, nice. they can find us on Forbes or Tech Target. Ron and I are regular contributors to both of those publications. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Cool. And what's really nice is uh, you guys are uh, a Maryland-based yes. startup. So proving that innovation can happen in more than it just one time zone. Can. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. And not even all the way up in New York or Boston. Although I moved from Boston to to the area, it's interesting the uh, uh, the the sorts of technology that's 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 here. So that's pretty cool. And also, so for those of you who are not familiar how to spell Cognolytica, the official spelling is C O G N I L 
why TICA, but it kind of actually doesn't matter because we knew that people were not going to be able to spell it right. So we actually reserved all the domain names. So it's uh, <laughs> if you spell it with two I's oh. or a Y before the I, or you even put an A or an O in there. Yeah, we, 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 we kind mm -hmm. of figured it out. So we, we registered them all. They all but kind of, of course, if you have some crazy spelling, you can't guarantee that, but but you should be able to, be able to find it. So, so give a try. Give a try at it. Right. Odds are pretty good you'll land. Pretty good. You can spell, spell it phonetically, you should get there. <laughs> <clears throat> the other thing, but, but maybe not do it on the corporate network <laughs> or when kids are around, so, just okay. in case. <laughs> um, or listeners can just scroll down. Uh, there'll be links okay. all over. Uh, we've got several links to, uh, we, we will have several links to this in the show notes. Oh, great. So. Very cool stuff. So you mentioned you had a book recommendation. Audible is a sponsor. And if you go to the data driven book.com listeners will get a one free audio book. Yep. Um, and they will toss us uh, a coin or two, uh, help support the show. And uh, so uh, are you into audiobooks? And if you do, uh, do you have a book recommendation? Yeah, um, well, of course, you know, I'm, I, wrote, I wrote two books. Both of them are very dry technical things. One is called Service Oriented or Be Doomed. It's actually a pretty good pretty good read. It talks about the whole movement towards service oriented architecture, but you can listen to it. I think it's a Wiley publication, so I, I think it's probably uh, an audible book. Um, the other one, of course, is okay. a reference book, XML and Web Services Unleashed. That's definitely not good reading. Uh, listening, that is. <laughs> actually, actually, that's not true. Um, I read that book. I oh, actually oh, you did? That. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's one of those Sam's yeah. books. So I oh, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried to put some humor into it. wasn't always successful. Um, the book that... So Frank reads in his sleep, by the way, just so okay. you know. He reads like a million books a oh. year. Wow. Yeah, crazy. Okay, that's like, yeah. Like, I'm trying to do the math. It's like a thousand a day. So... um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if only, days. man, if only. So um, <laughs> the book that really got me hooked to the whole MIT scene, but just in general, was, was a book called Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. And it was it was written by Stephen Levy, who who is is a very well known writer. He writes for a lot of uh, he writes a lot of big uh, articles. He's he's been big in Time and in all sorts of places. But Hackers: Heroes of the Computer Revolution is this is this great book that talks really about the early days of computing, and and some of these these personalities that that sort of came out of it. It's kind of funny how the uh, world of uh, computer science and artificial intelligence and all this have kind of really overlapped and kind of like the early days of, of, of some of these folks. So I, 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 that, that kind of got me hooked. So that, that, that's the book I'd recommend. I, I have to see if there's an audible book on that or not, but uh, look for it. Hackers Heroes of the Computer Revolution. Okay. There is an audio book. I just uh, popped over there while you were talking and uh, yep, it's available at audible. Great. Right. Nice. I know what I'm listening to next. Uh, so I am part of a book club and we do not read technical books for the book club. So uh, my recommendation is a little bit more lighthearted, but we just read My Not So Perfect Life by Sophie Kinsella. It was a really fun, easy read uh, about a uh, girl that lives in London and her dad started a glamping business. <laughs> yeah, really? really? Is it okay. <laughs> So, so for those that don't know what glamping is, is yeah. that glamorous camping <laughs> yeah. or something like that? So it was really fun. Okay. Um, and then yeah. another book that we read that I really liked was The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. It's um, a memoir about her life and, you know, the various struggles that she had growing up. I think she grew up in Appalachia. They moved all over. Um, and she was able to kind of come out of that poverty and, uh, you know, go to college and make something of her life. So it was an inspirational book. And I really liked that one as well. Interesting. So two, two comments on that one, there's actually a, a place in Farmville that offers glamping. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's uh, I'll have to, I'll have to put the link in the show notes. They're actually friends of ours, but I, the name of the business escapes me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, um, the the book the second book you recommended reminded me of one that I, I believe I listened to the audio book on that a couple of years ago is Hillbilly Elegy, and um, I have a um, I have a family from that area as well Appalachia that's that's kind of where my roots are so um, very very interesting that the whole lifestyle there and and how things go I've. I've been out there recently, even. I made a trip out to uh, Appalachia, a couple of them, last month. And um, it, you know, it, it's kind of shocking if people haven't, you know, if you haven't been out there, if you haven't visited, 
um, it is a, a very depressed and, um, you know, and, and also very beautiful area. Nature, nature is very beautiful there, but economically yeah, yeah. they're struggling and a lot of social uh, struggles that go on there. So I, I would, uh, I, I can't wait to get the show notes out on that because I know I will read that book as well <laughs> or listen to it. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think I found it online. If it's the, maybe the Dreamcatcher, Sandy River Outdoor, is that it? The Hotel Dreamcatcher? That is it. It's the Sandy River. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. Yep. And they do the ropes and confidence courses and all of that stuff. Um, and they've got glamping and they're, they're really interesting people that, uh, that run it. I believe they're from Sweden. Um, mm. But uh, my daughter, uh, my youngest daughter, the one still at home, I have older daughters who've made me a grandpa, but the younger, <clears throat> younger daughter and their, their daughter are friends and they hang out and it's, it's cool to have stuff like that uh, here in Farmville. Um I keep, I joke, Frank, Frank's familiar with this joke. I say all roads lead to Farmville. Um, <laughs> the vice presidential debate in October, 2016 happened right down, down the road here in Longwood oh. uh, university. So yeah, it's the center of the universe. I think. Uh, <laughs> Plus it's a video game. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually looking. I told you that story, right? Our, our mutual friend, Brian Moran's our mutual friend who loves Crocs. And Brian and I used to be business partners, but before that, before we really met, we were connected through the data community and he would see me on Twitter. Of course, I put on on Twitter that I lived in Farmville and then I would say things like I'm going out to feed the chickens or I'm going to go, you know, harvest some tomatoes or, you know, weed the garden. And he thought I was playing the game and I've never played that game. Oh, Oh, that Farmville. (laughs) Oh, <laughs> that yes, yeah. I finally made the connection. I'm like, oh, ding ding. Okay, got but it. <laughs> they did have a. They had a contest back when they were popular, where the winners got to come to Farmville and plant an orchard down by Buffalo Creek. That's cool. Wow, that's cool. yeah, nice. Yeah, big banner. It was a big deal. This, this reminds me. Of- I just wonder how many algorithms you've messed up, Andy, because you would say <laughs> oh. like, oh, I'm back in Farmville. Oh yeah, you travel and stuff like that. Headed to Farmville. Like there's probably in some like <laughs> dimly lit basement somewhere, there's somebody pouring over uh, either a Pandas data frame or Excel spreadsheet, pulling their hair out. What is this guy doing? <laughs> Maybe the, to, to help separate it though, they spell Farmville with a capital V for Ville. Um, and I, uh, I don't. So hopefully that's clarified, but I don't know. The machines aren't, you know, as we said earlier, the machines aren't that smart yet. They'll get there. I'm convinced. There you go. Well, this was a great show. I really appreciate y'all taking time to to meet with us. Uh, it's always good to talk to fellow podcasters. So for our guests, we had a, a meeting a few weeks ago where we just kind of shared ideas. And I walked away from that meeting with like, oh, we got to try this. Uh, we got to pick these things up. I I hope I, I think we may have shared one or two ideas with you, yeah. y'all telling you, you know, sure. how we do things that y'all shared with us. It was just great. It's a great idea. So if you're a podcaster, um, I would say, you know, every chance you get, maybe hang out with other podcasters. Yeah, absolutely. We, we geeked out on some hardware stuff. <laughs> so we wanted to spare our yes. audience that. Um, but yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, anything else you guys uh, like to add? No, we really enjoyed the podcast. This, you guys were a lot of fun to talk with. We asked some really great questions, and it sounds like you have a great community of, of folks listening and contributing to the podcast. We really, really appreciate being on, on here with you. Yeah, thanks for having us on as guests today. Awesome. It's been a pleasure having you. And with that, we'll let the nice British lady finish the show. Thanks for listening to Data Driven. Don't just listen, become a data driver by going to datadriven.tv to sign up to join the community, access to special events, tips and tricks, and more. Sign up today at datadriven.tv.